begin on page 20, uh, the May revise proposing to eliminate the CalWORKs program for savings of $1.6 billion. Uh, plus we have the most recent proposal to eliminate all COLAs going forward. Um, LAO, you have some alternatives here. I think uh, we need to, I mean, we're all very mindful of the impacts of eliminating such a program. And I think what we need to do is explore some alternatives for, we realize it's, we have to find some significant savings in the program, but uh, outright, outright elimination, personally, I'm not in favor of. I also want to note for members of the public and the um, members that page 21 also includes a CalWORKs reduction proposal, which was, I believe, in the original May revise. So we can address both of them at the same time. Okay. Good afternoon. Todd Bland with the Legislative Analyst Office. Um, essentially, the governor is proposing, um, kind of, yeah, sequentially proposed some changes to CalWORKs and then outright elimination. Uh, on the elimination issue, um, we, would re we, we, would, uh, we would not support that. Um, we believe it results in a, in a substantial cost shift to counties and a substantial loss of federal funds. Um, as an alternative, at quite a bit less savings, uh, we suggest you consider building on an aspect of current law. And that aspect of current law is that when the st if the state does not have enough money to fund welfare to work services um, and child care to help um, the CalWORKs families become self-sufficient, that is a reason for good cause, a reason for um, non-participation in the program. Uh, that's current law. So essentially building on that, we believe you could reduce the budget for employment services uh, by about 108 million and reduce the budget for child care by about 105 million. Those are roughly 10 and 15 percent of their current amounts. And that, on the child care, that was just the stage one child care. Um, you could make those reductions and then you could create targeted exemptions uh, for more uh, cases. Uh, the County Welfare Directors Association has been looking at this as well and they've come up with the concept of one of the target exemptions they were looking at was um, high, high cost child care cases such as uh, cases with a lot, of, a lot of either very young children or a lot of children under the age of you know, non-school age children. Um, to that you could add other um, um, potential targeted exemptions, and these would be, uh, we were thinking in the area of uh, cases with multiple barriers to employment, uh, learning disabilities, um, perhaps English language issues. Um, you could be very specific in these in statute, or you could be more permissive in terms of giving the counties the authority uh, to sort of make these exemptions. The goal would be the people who are exempted would be, vol it would be voluntary. If they chose to participate, they could. Um, the, the, but, but we have reduced the budget, so in theory, um, if they chose to participate and there wasn't sufficient funding, the savings would be real because you're going to reduce the appropriations for both of these amounts. It would create waiting lists essentially for those services. So essentially that's the LAO approach in a nutshell. The, the, the $201 million that we put on our sheet is actually slightly net of a little bit of grant costs because we would have less people participating. That would actually raise our grant costs a little bit, but we do receive the 80 percent federal participation participation on that, so it doesn't cost very much. So it's, the action would be a couple of cuts and then a teeny bit of grant costs coming in. That's our main recommendation in lieu of the um, elimination of CalWORKs. We do have, um, sort of turning to, to the next page, the governor's several proposals, a you know, grant reduction and the child only time limit and such. There, um, Again, we're, we're not really in favor of these either, uh, given the Federal uh, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act essentially is giving us an 80 percent funding source uh, for um, costs above, grant costs above our 2007 levels. Um, given that, we would suggest not making reforms until that funding stream ends. Um, although we think you might want to take action now because the kind of reforms you might want to do do take time and giving the counties time to plan. Um, our alternatives are much smaller than the governor's. We are thinking about adopting a community service requirement uh, for the families in the safety net, basically making them an offer of a community service requirement only if they turned it down and a home visit then didn't reveal that they had otherwise good cause. 
we would we would then terminate aid rather than outright termination. Uh, we also think that the self-sufficiency reviews that the governor proposes, the in-person interview, uh, we don't like the governor's approach to that, but we think a modified approach could work. Our approach would focus on the cases with adults. The governor's approach was very broad. It was virtually every case, even the child-only cases where there is no adult that we need to engage. So on a narrower basis, our approach was just do this to the cases with adults, um, try to engage them, spend a half hour with them. Uh, much smaller savings on the, on the order of about 16 million. And finally, a past proposal we put out to, in, to further increase the incentive to work would be to modify the earned income disregard. Um, we could have a long discussion, I'll keep it real brief. Uh, under current law, essentially as you earn money, the first 225 money you earn, your grant doesn't go down at all. After that, after the 225, it goes down 50 cents. It's, it's, so we call it the 225 and 50% disregard. Um, what we're proposing is you slightly flip that on its head. Instead, we make it 50% and 300. And the concept is if you aren't meeting federal work participation requirements, you only get the 50% reduction. You sort of get the $300 bonus comes if you're meeting. It was to move the incentive up the line. It has the effect of moving some people's grants up, some people's down, although if they choose to work more, no one's goes down. Uh, it was discussed a year ago. Those are our kind of smaller proposals in lieu of what the governor has on page 21. Happy to take questions. Can you tell me uh, what the total savings is from all of your proposals combined if we were to take them all? Well, actually, the... The, the main proposal is the, the non-elimination targeted targeted exemptions. The, the net savings from that is 201 million. That I got, and then you, that got, you got the others. Million the others would add up to about 45, but we're actually recommending them for 1011. You take action now to plan for them, but you wouldn't. We would not recommend them at this time because you have the 80 percent funding stream. I see. Okay, Mr. Cheney. I uh, to quote two questions. I, uh, this one is always frustrating. Um, <clears throat> Short of elimination, I'm not quite sure we can, we structure the program to make it more effective. We can do it, but savings is kind of an anomalous term in this context. The MOE is the MOE is the MOE. We're above, savings have to be used for TANF MOE. We're above the M under, if we, if you do nothing to the program, you're a four to $500 million above the MOE. Oh, So well, we can, you we can actually take that. these reductions. So yeah, the issue here is not, how the main did we issue get above with the MOE, we haven't been above the MOE our, in 10 years. Because our caseload is rising very, very fast, 10% uh, the current year, the projection is 15% of the budget. It's another but issue. The federal we'll be match. Federal block grant doesn't. No, no, the federal overmatch, the stimulus. It helps. We'd be even more over doesn't without it. Doesn't that match? I see. So we're actually over the MOE. We are. Okay. And we're over the MOE um, last uh, this last year, year as well. And, and it's because of the new caseload. And in some prior years, we've been over the, depending on how it is that one chose to count MOE expenditures, right. we could have been over the MOE. Uh, well, that's fair. If we had but, counted everything that was counted. I think the chart we don't have today that we've had sometimes in the past is what all we're counting as MOE. Now, it gets awkward with your budget where you're eliminating, but assume your prior, may, your first may revise. We ought to think about I mean, are we still counting, for instance, are we counting the probation camps that are now funded by the 0.15 VLF? Are those in the MOE anymore? Because they used to be. The probation you know, camps we, aren't we, in there. One time we spent federal funds on them. Right. Then we moved them back to general fund, and when they're general fund, we cannot count them. Right. Your option okay. I mean, would be to I'm go the other direction. I'm just trying to figure direction. out what we're counting I, anymore, because we used to count a lot of our child care. We count the CalWORKs right. in community colleges. We count. Right. I'm trying. Where, where else? Traditionally, we have saved about a billion dollars in other universes by counting them as MOE. And even the governor's elimination proposal, by their numbers, only saves a billion dollars. That is a, only half of the value no, of the MOE. So no, I'm trying no, to figure it, out. It, it's 1.7 billion altogether. Yeah, well, and the MOE is 2.7. The, the, the you're saying is, we're over, right. that means you're spending three. And they're only going to save a billion by eliminating the program. I think so that, that means I got two billion stashed in other places in the budget that nobody's like talking about. They, Sorry, Nick Buchan, Department of Finance. The um, 1.7 billion is also assumes October 1st implementation. Right. So the full year value is um, above two billion if we eliminate the program. Right. And the counties, in part, help us meet the maintenance of effort. And um, 
I mean, it just the maintenance of effort has always been the, lots this, of places. Because not you're just above the maintenance fund. of effort, you really have it's a lot more flexibility. Now. In the past, yes, it was. It was sort of like, oh, we're on the floor. We could make a program savings, right. which would lead to TANF savings. But because of the MOE, it was like, okay, how are we going to convert that into general fund savings? Okay, but now um, you, that's changed. You, um, you don't have that issue for the first four, five, six hundred because million of dollars load. of your cuts right. this year. Because of the case right. Okay, yes. no, that's fair. It's, and it's helpful and to Just to clarify that, if, if we weren't going to do any reductions, in CalWORKs um, and we didn't get the RF funding, uh, we would have over a billion dollars of general fund right. in social services budget just to fund the core CalWORKs program. Right. Now, with the RF funding, it's my understanding that that can be used, and I don't know how much of it is which and how, whatever, to, to do a subsidized employment program. Has anybody looked at yeah. how we might offer funds from TANF to help folks get jobs and help or I believe, people hire people without as much cost. I believe the counties and the department, and maybe Mr. Garcia can elaborate some more, um, are working on a proposal whereby I believe uh, the counties would be able to come up with an in-kind match, if I got that right, that where they do, essentially there is no state cost and we could draw down the 80% money to the extent counties wanted to create subsidized employment. That, that's the level I know it at. I, I just, is there something we would have to do in trailer to make that more possible or incentivize it or make it a good thing to do? There, there, there might be, and, and, and in fact, there is some trailer bill language proposed to go with, with that idea. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to make the program function, I, I can pretty much say, I mean, I understand that may not be the view of every member of the conference committee, but most of us are not prepared to eliminate this program. So what we can do to constrain it, what we can do to save if we are, in fact, spending over the MOE are, are legitimate discussions to me. I do think we ought to encourage the subsidized employment because as long as we have the extra match, we ought to be trying to help the economy and and helping people get work and helping people who might not otherwise be able to hire an employee be able to hire an employee and kind of move things along is a good thing. Um, if there's no state cost there, that would appear to be win-win. So that's, that's a huge deal that's a huge deal for, for recipients. Now remind me why we didn't do the income disregard thing last year, because I remember we, we had be, a lot of controversy back and forth about whether that was a good way to do it. I kind of like it, but I'm not quite sure what, why well, we rejected it. Well, some recipients year. would make would, would have lower grants if they didn't uh, if they didn't. You, you, it, it's if they an didn't incentive. Work. It's the, the idea is will you will you yeah, increase your work like effort to move up the move up the move up the slope of the line where you get them slightly more generous uh, payment? Madam Chair, not everyone would necessarily. On that point, yeah, yeah. you had said earlier that gives incentive and those folks who would be on the losing end uh, have the opportunity to just right. get back to work, except in this economy that's not to always a, a choice. I, I, again, well, work that was also a budget here. plus one proposal for us, but, uh, but I, I, I take your point about yeah. how, what, what will the health of the economy be in terms yeah. of being able to employ welfare recipients even in 10-11. Well, but to meet the, the, the workforce requirements, they can be doing whatever them and their social worker agree on and it's a wide yeah, range right. of activities. They could be going to school, they could be, but the they can do community service. disregard was about earned income. Is earned is income about, That's about oh, earned income, not so just about not, participation. So that might be a problem, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's probably the debate. The other yeah. question, I mean, I, I do remember the first, <clears throat> when we first did this program, there was a lot of debate about whether that one year old age was the right age or whether it should be 18 months or whether it should be two years to begin with. Right. Um, because the cost of the child care for that parent, and this is just one we all need to think about if we're thinking about these. That one, it's on, the, on, on one hand it feels like, well, why are we letting these people not work? But on the other hand, I do remember the discussion at the time of the CalWORKs was originally done, which was should it be 18 months? Should folks stay home? Is the child care at that age so expensive? Right. But if they were to do that, then are those folks, is those two years count against your 60 months? Even yeah. though you're not engaged in work activities, on the, on, I would, I, yeah. we, we would recommend if you go with targeted exemptions, you're exempting these people, not requiring them to participate, that you would probably um, not the count their state it. clock during that time for which That's they were exempted. I mean, if they I mean, chose to participate and they took advantage of the services, you would count. Their federal clock has to count. There's no way around that. The 60-month clock. The federal but the one. The, oh, state the, the, mo the state The state two-year thing. We don't have a two-year anymore. We got rid or of that a few oh, years ago. We? Okay, sorry. So what's the state clock? clock? But there's a state 60-month for the adult app, and then we move you to the safety net after that. So probably the the... You could argue it either way, but I, I would I would tend to think on the policy merits you would tend to want to say if you're going to exempt the people from participation and not provide the services, 
we shouldn't count their 60 yeah, month clock against that adult for that time period. Again, we see this yeah, as a time limited the, thing that you would be doing yeah, just for, for a fi year, 15, you'd 15, 15 you'd months through the like end of the hour period. The, it, you know, it, it isn't without regret. I mean, we're, we're to some extent um, basically telling families who we would like to take advantage of our services and our child care and our interventions to be able to become self-sufficient sooner, we're delaying that. I mean, it, but again, we're in a difficult budget environment, we're making difficult choices. The, the advantage of this is you're able to achieve substantial savings, you know, $200 million. Until yeah. the governor proposed eliminating the program, it was more savings than they had. Let me, um, let me just mention, uh, I think staff and the LAO and the Department of Finance and the department are all working on a, a um, well, I don't know, does it include the Department of Finance? Are we all working on this package? <laughs> anyway, there's a package being worked up of alternatives other than eliminating the program. And a lot of the things that uh, were just discussed, I think, are uh, being looked at as part of that package that would come up, come back to us, because we're going to have to hold this open. Um, Mr. Leno, then Mr. Blumenfield, then Mr. DeLeon. Okay, then Mr. Blumenfield. Okay, well, good. I think you, you've just by clearing it up that there's just there's just no way we can eliminate CalWORKs. I, I'm curious though, are there any other states in, in the country that have completely abdicated their responsibility for the social safety net or proposed such a thing? No other states have uh, done such a thing. So we would be, just, just clarified, if we actually took this proposal, we would be the only state in the nation to abdicate this responsibility. Would we be the only... Um, it would shift to our counties. It would shift, well, largely but, but shift as, to our as counties, a, but as, as a state, there would be no as state, a state program. We are the yes. only state who would abdicate the response. Obviously, if we had responsible counties, which we many most of them are, they would they would pick up this burden, and it would be an additional cost to them. Um, but I'm also curious: are there any other are there any countries in the industrialized world that have um, not don't have a social safety net and have abdicated that responsibility? I mean, I don't know of any. That's why I'm asking the question. It's more of a rhetorical question, but I, I just I think it's it's irresponsible to even have this elimination out on the table. I mean, we're talking about a responsible compromise and trying to figure something out, and that's, and that's good. And maybe it was just put out there to provoke and, and spark a dialogue. But, um, I mean, it's outrageous to even propose. Mr. DeLeon. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, given the number of people right now who are being affected by this uh, really bad economy and a lot of uh, folks who are uh, being driven into poverty, and perhaps homelessness. Um, and especially with the federal government's willingness to pay for CalWORKs program growth, does, does it make sense to actually eliminate this program in its entirety, or can we better target the cuts? when it comes to CalWORKs. And I'm ref referencing to the Fed's willingness to fund CalWORKs growth. Mm -hmm. For those, for now, those reasons the, and we, the county cough shift, we are recommending against elimination in favor of our alternative. And, and we believe the general fund condition is such that we recognize that we'd be leaving a lot of federal funds on the table and we recognize the, the hardship that this proposal would, um, would result in that said, we believe that based on our general fund uh, condition, based on where it is that we have flexibility to make reductions, where it is that we have federal mandates versus federal opt-ins, um, that this is a reduction that's necessary and that program elimination is what is needed to balance you, you, budget. You may have answered the question already. Perhaps Senator DeShaney may have answered it earlier. I, I just got here a little late. What's the dollar figure we'll leave on the table uh, with this? Uh, CalWORKs proposed elimination? Roughly 4.2 billion, and that would be three, well, on a full year basis, $3.7 billion federal block grant, and on a more temporary basis, the American recovery, the ARA, the ARA the um, contingency, dollars. probably about 500 million. That, that's so the numbers we're using. 4.2 4. 2 billion? Right. 4.2 billion one-time ARA dollars of uh, 500, was that? Or well, 3.7 plus, plus 500 in plus the ARA 500. dollars. Okay. And Based on 3.7, which is ongoing. Yes. The one-time dollars about half a, okay. Um, half a million, um, a billion, I should say. Um, so if you can recall when we're talking about IHSS and what the potential that we leave on the table too with the enhanced, you know, FMAP, uh, um, uh, uh, 
criteria, how much will we leave on the table right there if, in fact, we move forward with the complete elimination or at least 90 percent of that elimination? I, I think our rough number was 1.4 million was what we uh, shared with you. So billion. roughly between CalWorks, billion. And, billion. Sorry. between CalWorks and IHSS, we're leaving on the table about uh, close to $6 billion? Uh, they're not quite apples to apples. Um, the 1.4, I believe we had, we had properly adjusted for you for the remainder of the year. The 4.2 would be, the 500 would be correct. The 3.7, I guess we'd want three quarters of that. So maybe three and a, you were and a half billion. You're saying the 1.4 billion was adjusted for? That was adjusted for the uh, for nine months. For, 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 the, for nine for the, months. Yes. Whereas the, okay. the 3.7 is the whole block grant for the entire year. The proposal, I believe, is nine months of that. So you'd want to take three quarters of 3.7 plus 500 million. So not quite the 4.2 we were at, but Help me understand the nine months part. Part uh, Because that's when the proposal goes into effect. Uh, okay, it's gotcha. It's implementation gotcha. lag. Okay, it's implementation. Um, again, I, I just underscore and echo and, and ditto my colleague, Mr. Bob Bloomingfield. Um, I won't get into the moral issues, obviously. It's the same that I spoke about earlier today with regards to IHSS. Um, but, you know, fiscally, I think uh, our, our, our cuts, we know they're going to happen. We don't know how much yet. Um, it's clear it's going to happen. Um, but I think that we could be much smarter, more intelligent in the way we go about doing this. So, again, the, the, uh, underlying principle, if you will, or the overarching goal with the way we go about, you know, cutting this budget deficit is how we are as least injurious to the most vulnerable and how we are fiscally prudent by not leaving all these dollars on the table from the feds that we're not going to have coming into California. Um, because a lot of these proposals right now are, are, and I mean no offense to anyone who's from the South who's present here today, but it takes us back to Mississippi. And some of these proposals take us, take us back to the pre-enlightenment period. Well, you know, if we're going to have a moat around us and our own security forces, you know, it's, it's beyond belief. So, you know, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. DeLeon. Mr. Nielsen? Well, I'd like to, a little brief historical perspective. The predecessor of this Cal Works was the GAIN program, Greater Avenues for Independence. And I remember the birth of that in this room. Art Agnos and John Garamendi and Jim Nielsen presenting a bill with the room packed with people opposing it, fighting it desperately with all the passion of those last many days that we have sat here and heard people don't cut my program. They were fighting it. This has worked. And it, the, the successor of GAIN, I, Cal Works, has indeed worked. And, and I think uh, because it's not about working for your welfare or just getting as much as welfare forever, but that you will become employable. It's about employability and supporting the development of employable skills. So I, I think it's a, a very necessary thing to preserve. But where we are at today, we are facing a huge problem. And we would hope that it's a short run one problem. Maybe two years where we can turn the corner if the economy improves, and we won't get anywhere unless the economy improves, no matter what the legislature does. But assuming that it does, it is as you're crafting this, and, and, and I understand there's a group of you working. I don't know that the Republicans have been involved in this, but I would like that we would be uh, to come up with, with an idea in the next day or so uh, that uh, would be along the lines of some of the LAO suggestions that uh, without elimination, but can preserve the program. And in some way, I would ask you to craft that uh, with keeping in mind that maybe the cuts can be a little greater if they are of a more temporary nature, meaning that there's some hope out there that we can restore uh, some of the uh, CalWORKs reductions that, that we have to accrue for the short-run cash flow need. So could you kind of couch that into some of your deliberations and some of the, uh, some of the LAO uh, observations, I think, have merit. They have been discussed here. Senator DeCheney has talked about them. Uh, but I, my argument would be to pare them down as very much as you can uh, for now, but offer some hope within a year or so that we could kick up and, and uh, things improve economically. CalWORKs can be uh, restored to a, to a better level. But I don't think we can just uh, hold on to we've got to preserve it and protect it. That cannot happen with this magnitude of money. But I think maybe there's some ways that we could at least preserve the essence of CalWORKs and, and help as many, many people as we can continue on that employable stra uh, uh, track. Uh, so I'd like to, like to have us work with you as, uh, on that as well, the Republicans. Great. Excellent. We like that. Mr. Leno. Thank you, Madam Chair. I certainly share some of the sentiments of my colleagues on the Assembly side. 
Uh, one, and also just to build upon what are the unintended consequences, the ramifications of the elimination of the program. Uh, we have a note in our briefing that a million dollars spent on CalWORKs results in $1.34 million in economic output and $25,000 in state, state sales tax revenue. So if we were to equate that for $5 billion spent on CalWORKs, that would equate to about $125 million in sales tax dollars that we'd be losing. I wondered, if, do we have a calculation on how much state income tax we would also lose and how many additional people would be unemployed, all the teachers and the uh, social workers, all the welfare to work workforce? Uh, what percentage, is it more than a percent or two additional unemployment? And you have 0.6? And then, and, and how, what does that equate to in uh, state income tax laws as well? So we, again, had to see the whole picture of it. Uh, with that said, I would like to reject the elimination. All right, members, we have a motion to reject the proposed elimination of CalWORKs. And um, I would add that uh, if that motion passes, we would direct our staff uh, to continue working with the counties, departments, Department of Finance uh, to come back with a proposal to seek substantial savings within the program. But the motion before us is uh, to reject the elimination. Madam Chair, I just want to state that uh, uh, I can't support that motion. Um, no comment necessarily on that issue itself, but it is a substantial portion of uh, the solutions that we have to come to. Uh, and uh, in the absence of something else, it's just impossible to support that. Okay. So, yes, Mr. Nielsen. And I would echo that as well. I will simply abstain on, the, on, it, uh, on this particular vote uh, in, in the spirit that we're going to continue to work on it to come up to something that, that would be substantial at least for the, the next year, uh, but, but that we should be working on some alternative. So, Mr. Neil, uh, Nilo, are you an abstention or a no? An abstention. So on our side, it's three ayes, two abstentions. On the Senate side, it is three ayes and one no. Correct? Okay. Uh, so with that, but you have the direction. And then there's also the most recent proposal, which we don't have before us in writing, to, uh, from the governor to eliminate all COLAs in this program going forward. And Madam Chair, we would um, have significant concerns with this level of restoration to the budget in light of the general fund situation. In terms of the proposal to eliminate the COLA prospectively, similar to our discussion relative to the SSP COLA, as well as COLAs across the budget, we think given our out year um, challenges that it's more appropriate to have an annual determination. We think that the type of COLAs that drive um, annual increases are, are not the way to go, that it's a year-by-year -year determination based on the level of resources available, and as such, we're proposing elimination of COLAs across um, items in the budget. I appreciate the presentation. The problem is we don't have it in writing in our agenda, and it's because it was just so recently submitted that we can't really, I mean, I don't, I don't favor the proposal, but I also don't feel comfortable taking some action or recommending to this committee that it take action right now because we don't have it in the agenda. It hasn't been out in the, the public, you know, noticed on our agenda for discussion. We don't have trailer bill language. We don't have specifics. So what I would ask if, if the committee has no objection is to hold that item open until we do get something written that we can show to the public that here we are, we're going to consider this. It, that's the problem. It's not on here, and yet it, is, it was a recently submitted proposal by the governor to eliminate all CalWORKs COLAs going forward. It's I think a it's very trailer bill that's issue. just coming out. Um, yeah. it, it, and it, the reason it's not before you as a budgetary action is there's no impact to the 2009-10 budget. Um, it's, this is prospective uh, beginning 10-11. So you, you will see trailer bill language that um, would eliminate just run a bill if it's not till 10-11. See if anybody bites. Run it through policy committee. That might be the better way to go. Okay, so we'll move on then. Uh, I believe we also discussed page 21. We can move on to page 22. Department of Social Services Cash Assistance Program for Immigrants and California Food Assistance Program. Uh, looks like two, oh, from the two programs there would be a uh, $85.7 million savings from CAPI and 33.8 from CFAP. 
recommendation is to hold open at this point, um, but I think we need discussion and perhaps we can take action today. Mr. Cheney. I just have a, well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with holding this open because I think the one thing we need to think about on this one, and I don't know, I mean, it's, it's frustrating. This is the, one of the, you know, 14th annual rant against the federal government for creating this problem. But, um, you know, prior to 1996, all legal immigrants were covered the same as citizens under most of these programs. When they changed that with TANF and everything else, and, you know, we did the first state-only programs um, with, with Governor Wilson's support because we knew that as a high immigrant state, we, we couldn't afford to have that many people being thrown off of, of, you know, fundamental support programs. So um, I appreciate that subsequent to that, many states did as we did and created state-only programs. The federal government then stepped up a few years later and started covering some of the populations that we covered initially with our state-only programs. Unfortunately, they never just did the simple thing and said, oh, gosh, that was a mistake. We should just allow legal immigrants to get the same benefits just like they always used to do. Um, and so now we remain with these state-only programs that are a little bit odd and anomalies. The, the CAPI now, we're, I, didn't we for, I mean, it's only people who got here before 96 or something. I mean, we haven't been, we've we been allowing new people into CAPI? Oh, because they're newly qualified, but they're not five After years. After the, the 10, ten we, we changed it to 10 years of deeming the sponsor's income if there was a sponsor involved. Okay. So if you sort of run the clock from... I get confused about 96 and 98, but essentially you run the clock there, forward yeah. the 10 years. So essentially we are taking new folks into the cash assistance program for immigrants. Um, that's one reason why it's growing. And that's one of our options would be to return to that longer term deeming or perhaps think about restricting the program to people who are essentially um, living on their own with CAPI. In yeah. other words, often they're part of multi-generational households. Yeah, that's so usually. in a difficult budget environment, we might say, the living with family, your benefits yeah, may be terminated, but living on your own will continue them. So Maybe that's sort that's of the LAO approach to this. The, uh, you could combine that, that with a, with a more enhanced deeming approach as well. well. The deeming was ten years. We did ten. We originally did five. We originally we did came five. Up to I the remember five, that. And then we added five more. Oh, I see. And it was because we haven't. But but the problem well, we, became at least to, as I understand the existing caseload in this. It's mostly these senior citizen widows that, you know, they're 80 years old and they're never going to learn English, so they can't become citizens kind of problem. I, I don't know how much of it is that, but um, some of it is, you know, yeah. refugee. A lot of it's a refugee population. A lot of it's the, widows. The refugees um, had, had a seven-year exemption, and then declining. there was some recent law that actually gave the refugees some new benefits. So, yeah, it, it, it's people who – it's refugees who've had that expire. I, mean, I think it's a multiple fair – You know, first of all, you know, the – you know, saying up front that the federal government should be just doing whatever it is they do and we should be matching that and just making it work. Um, Re-looking at the <clears throat> criteria for the program, it has been 10 years. The original notion was that it was sort of a temporary idea and it's kind of lingered. And um, as much as I don't like treating immigrants differently than, than citizens, I, I, this is a little strange because of the state-only nature of it. Because at this point, the feds have picked up a large piece of the original population, right? Especially on food stamps, L less so yeah, with, less so get to with the, the SSI, issue. SSP folks. Okay, so now the food stamps, um, they have done that same thing. We started out servicing only seniors and children. They finally went to giving food stamps to seniors and children, and now we're covering a different population. So on this one, if, if, if we ever was going to do any reduction in this arena, I mean, I'm thinking that the food stamp one for working age adults is, 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 is tricky. I mean, is, is the piece that's left, right? I mean, these are working age right. adults that were giving food stamps. Uh, good afternoon. Erica Lee from the Legislative Analyst Office. Um, we are offering actually a more targeted uh, variant to okay. the, pro the proposal of the governor to actually eliminate, eliminate CFAP. Eliminate the programs, yeah. Yeah, we're looking at a more targeted population and retaining CFAP benefits for those families that are only receiving CFAP benefits. So as um, Mr. Bellin was saying earlier, the families that uh, are sort of multi-generational that may be receiving federal food stamps programs they would no longer be receiving if, if there were a CFAP uh, eligible. Yes, they they would be cut. But yeah, if somebody else in your household 
is, is eligible some sort for of federal food, food stamps, coupon. you should just take those. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, that that's our more targeted program. option. It's. Do you know how many? I mean, what what's that? Um, according to uh, the department, it's about half of the CFAP caseload. Mm. So it would we would see about half of the savings of the governor's proposal, about seventeen million dollars in budget. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the kind of thing. If people are overlapping benefits, if I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I just think there's some room to rethink. This was a state-only program. It was designed at a time when we were very frustrated that that they were just, you know, abandoning. A, a very large population of legal immigrants. We've now got it down to a fairly small population in both cases. I'm a little more sensitive to the SSI issue, mostly because it's a different population than we're now serving with the food stamps because of the age mm -hmm. issue. The, the SSI population is a little more vulnerable in that they are aged or disabled. But if they're living with family, why would they be eligible for the SSI? Well, because I don't believe we, de we don't deem the income of the most likely household? junior members of their family to them. Well, we might have to do that. I mean, that's essentially that's essentially the concept of our proposal. There is either 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 more deeming or um, or sort of um, targeting and saying, income. well, if you're actually residing in a household, uh, yeah. a, a much bigger household, you're just not eligible, regardless of whether we're deeming or not. No, that um, makes sense. So, all right, that, how many people would be on your single we, caseload? I believe on the. CAPI proposal, our pr approach, we can save about 34 million instead of the governor's 85. Depending, you, you could get more aggressive, you could sort of use both approaches. There's sort of living alone and deeming, and if you kind of sort of do both, you might even more But if I just did savings. the living alone, about 34 I, um, million. Could that's be the about savings. 34. Okay, members, um, I, I think I misspoke a little earlier. The recommendation actually is to reject the proposals. Um, Mr. DeLeon, and then Mr. Blumenfield. Yeah, I would uh, I would concur with you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I, I would reject uh, this proposal. Um, I think this is a very, a very good Republican program, and I want to keep this program uh, moving forward. Uh, it was Governor Pete Wilson, obviously, who originated this program, and it was Ronald Reagan, the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986. So the Republicans have done some really good stuff when it comes to immigration, and I want to keep this uh, uh, discussion uh, alive without a doubt. But I would reject the proposal. Okay, Mr. Blumenfield. Thank you. Um, first, I want to concur in terms of rejecting this proposal. I mean, this is, we talk about bright red moral lines. This is one of those, those places where we're talking about life and death. I mean, the folks that, just to be clear with people, we're talking about legal, elderly, disabled folks who are in this country legally and, and they've been served by this program and you're, you're you know, pulling out the last vestige of hope that they have. And, and there's, there's stories about people. I mean, I've, I've read articles where these women will kill themselves after they don't get certain things. There was a couple articles last year about that. And in terms of the proposal about people living together, I, I'm very cautious about creating disincentives for, for families to stay together because that's often how people um, get through these tough times. I mean, there's only, there's only so much water you can pour in the soup and still have there be nutrition in it. And if this family has, uh, you know, a little bit of income and you're asking them to stretch it to, the, to this person, but if they go live on their own, then they can get some, some assistance, uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. But uh, since the proposal on the table is to reject it, I wholeheartedly um, support the proposal. Okay, what, you've heard the, the assembly side. What's the, what's the pleasure of the Senate side? I mean, I, I just leave it open a minute to explore some of those because we've we got these trade-offs going on. I mean, I'm not real excited about the notion of sending the regular SSI recipients more into poverty. So, I'm, I mean, granted, this may not be that much savings, but I, mean, I just think it's worth thinking about for okay. a minute. I mean, genetically, I'm, I'm prone to reject, but, I, but I'm, I'm sort of uh, troubled but there, that there may be targeted options. So, I'd... I, mean, I understand. There, there's a couple of other senators, I think, that wanted to be heard as well, Mr. Dutton and then Mr. Lowenthal. Uh, just one little question I got about uh, page 21. Were we not going to go over any reforms in CalWORK? No, uh, we, we talked about a number of them, and we directed our staff to come back with that. Okay, so we're, we're holding this one open then? Yes. Coming back? Okay. I didn't realize. I was confused. I was confused where we were going. I couldn't tell which one we were on. So. No, no. We directed them to. Okay. We rejected the elimination and re directed uh, substantial savings to be found. Yeah, 
And I guess I also would just uh, want to thank for the acknowledgement that Republicans do have heart. And I was always a little, little taken back that the Clinton administration actually cut the federal funds on this program. So, you know, it's nice to know that you've given us acknowledgement for being uh, compassionate conservatives. Thank you. Mr. Lowenthal. Well, it's nice to follow my compassionate colleague. Uh, no, I, I would be voting if, if there was a vote to reject. I think this needs to be rejected. But since we're going to hold it open to look at options, I'm fine with that too. But just to put on the record, I would be voting to reject this. But I'll wait. It's fine. Well, I understand that the um, CAPI rates are tied to the SSI rates. So if we take a, a cut in SSI, there's a corresponding cut in CAPI. Is that right? Is that the oh, issue right. you were yeah. you were looking you at? You would get some of these yeah. savings. I believe the number that's in front of you is is the net additional amount you get from the element. They've already taken. So th this okay. is what you would get in addition. So if you All reject right, this, you don't get any of, time, of this. Members, why don't we hold this open? We know that the assembly is, is willing to move forward, but there are some substantial concerns on the Senate side. So uh, let's do them the courtesy of, of getting the uh, information that Mr. Cheney has requested as far as whether or not we can find some other savings there uh, and move on. All right. On page 23, Health and Human Services Realignment for Savings of 550,000, excuse me, 550 million. Thank you. Dropping the zeros there. Um, I hardly know where to start on this one. Um, <laughs> it's a big one, obviously. Um, perhaps, LAO, you could start out by answering the question in my mind, how solid are the savings that we're looking at on this page? I mean... I we would sort of view this as more a conforming issue. If you if you take deep reductions in um, in home supportive services, CalWORKs, and other programs, there's going to be county savings as well. This proposal to us, although it's a changing of the sharing ratios, we wouldn't necessarily even call it realignment, but essentially it's a way of capturing uh, those savings uh, by essentially then changing. So um, in our view, this is more conforming to your other actions. If you don't eliminate CalWORKs, Counties don't get that savings. If you don't make deep reductions in IHSS, they don't get those. So, okay, I, th so I, think you, I think you tend to return to this depending yeah. on the degree to which you make other reductions that result in county savings. Okay. And also, uh, our, our local government group has some broader thoughts, I believe, about realignment. Got it. So depending on what we do in the other areas, we'll come back to this. So we'll hold, hold that op item open. Page 24, this is a legislative proposal. Um, statewide fingerprint imaging system for a savings of $3.15 million. Uh, since it doesn't come from the LAO or the Department of Finance, I don't know who to ask to start with this. Mr. Leno, good place. Our auditor looked at this finger imaging system, 1995. I think it was 94, 95, somewhere in there. And the determination was that there was virtually no fraud in the system. I think she went so far as to say that the approximately $32 million which was spent to create it was a waste of money and that the annual costs of around $8 million to continue to run it was also a waste. Uh, and we've been trying to put an end to this in a modified fashion just relative to food stamps, uh, disregarding the costs uh, associated with uh, CalWORKs uh, and other benefits that make use of it, uh, only to meet a gubernatorial veto. But given that the auditor has spoken and said that this is not money well spent, given the seriousness of our fiscal situation, uh, given that there are no more food stamps, we're talking, I know this, is, this measure before us is broader than food stamps, but with regard to food stamps, uh, there are no food stamps to trade or to make uh, nefarious deals with because of the uh, electronic debit scheme, and that we do map, we have uh, quality control systems in place as well. Uh, everyone who applies must have a Social Security number. We match it against... Franchise Tax Board and Prison and Death Records, Employment Development. Uh, we've got some good systems in place. 48 other states have dropped this altogether because they were 
like-minded to our audit. How do we continue to defend this at this point? A different way of thinking about the audit is that it confirms that deterrence works. And um, in some ways, that's, that's the goal and the focus of the system. The system is, um, it aims to establish requirements that by requiring um, applicants to have to fingerprint and knowing that that's going to be part of what we're doing, we are deterring potentially fraudulent um, claimants from coming and applying for, for the program. And we think that this program uh, more than pays for itself in terms of the level of uh, fraud deterrence that it results in. So we have the state welfare reform has established work requirements. And so if you were going to fraudulently try to double your benefit, you'd have to document twice the work requirements as well? We, we also know that, um, that the work participation is not exactly at the level as that the work requirements would require. We have a substantial number of the population in sanctioned status. We have other populations that are not meeting the work requirements. So while, you know, generally there's, there, the issue has been raised that people are supposed to be subject to work, are subjects of work participation requirements, and in order to be receiving duplicate aid, they'd have to um, be subject to twice the work requirements. Um, it, it, we also know that that we don't have 100% adherence to said work requirements, and we think that the, the system does its job very well. If that's your strongest argument, and I'm going to tie you to it, then you would be able to document that in all of these other states that dropped it, they saw spikes in their levels of fraud. Correct? I mean, that's our fear, that we drop the system, we're going to see fraud increase. All these other states have dropped. Can you document that their fraud has increased? I think we'd have to, in some ways, also look at an apples-to-apples -apples comparison about what other systems the other states have in place. And we think in California this has worked. Many counties also use the CFA system for purposes of general assistance and verifying du potential duplicate aid uh, fraud there as well, because they also believe that, um, that it works, and we think the system more than pays for itself. Yeah, and right. Just to follow up, the, the, the one of the few areas of raw data that we do have on this is um, L.A. County did a study a number of years ago on a similar system, and when we extrapolated um, the savings that L.A. documented um, statewide, it was found to uh, deter over um, $60 million um, that otherwise would have gone fraudulently into the program. And when was that done? Um, it was a number of years ago. Many, many years ago, and we've put into place quality control system since then and switch to EBT, the electronic debit. And this review was done after the BSA audit was, um, was concluded. Okay. What we, I think, would benefit the committee is if you could share with us what other states have in place. I, I believe that New York's governor, by executive order, has recently dropped it for the state of New York. Which they were the third last state to have it. Now it's just Texas and California which has this. So other states are doing something. Well, and one, one big difference between California and other states as well is um, other states have a single eligibility determination system, whereas California has um, the SAW system. So we currently have four. It's going to go down to three. But uh, the point is these systems are distinct and do not talk to each other. Um, so in other states, if you have one single system, that makes it easier to detect uh, duplicate cases. Just to reiterate, I, I think if you could help us with some apple-to-apple -apple comparisons, or I mean, we're talking about enough money to save Hastings College of the Law. And <laughs> Which is our primary goal, after all, Of course. Right? <laughs> and we're talking upwards of $8 million, and that if there is a less expensive way, I'm, I'm not arguing in support of fraud. Is there a less expensive way for the state to secure our systems without continuing to invest in this system that our auditor says is a waste of money? Sure. We understand your concerns. And just to clarify on the dollars themselves, this is the first, uh, 2009 10 would be the first year that would reflect federal participation in this program. So that brings our general fund um, cost down to 4.9 million. I understand that. And, and that also, there is, I believe, a clear deterrent 
in eligible residents participating in our food stamp program. And again, I know it's not apples to apples, but we do rank, if not 50th out of 50 states, at the very bottom of all states. And we're leaving upwards of $2 billion of federal food stamp benefits on the table. So there's real reason to pursue some way other than this finger imaging system. And for those who may be eligible, it's aside from the inconvenience of of course, people who may be working two minimum wage jobs, not easily accessing state offices to go participate.